episode 42. Man, we are getting up there. It just seems like last week we were on episode 41. It's crazy, I know. So, this week, I am going to focus on specifically the military. And by that, I mean military questions. I often, when I will uh, solicit for questions when it comes to the podcast, I'd say at least half are military-based. And more often than not, I will ignore the vast majority of those questions. Or I, maybe ignore is not a good word for it because I definitely look at them. I choose not to answer them because I just don't want to be always known as a military guy. I'm very appreciative of the experience that I gained. I have nothing but, well, I have other than great things to say sometimes about my background, but more often than not, uh, I got nothing but great things to say about it. I just, like I said, don't want to be, I don't want to be pigeonholed, but I also realize that people have a ton of questions about the military. So today that is all I'm going to answer are military related questions which is good timing. Um, today is the 4th of June. So we just made it through our Memorial Day weekend, which is a military-centric holiday. And I love seeing all the flags out. I love, you know, up here in Montana, pretty patriotic area of the country for sure. And there were flags out everywhere, driving through the middle of town, you know, driving near the cemeteries, there's flags there. It was great. So it, it's kind of good timing. Uh, you know, the only thing that it sucks is that you see most of those flags are sitting there at half mast, which there's a lot of reverence associated with the with the flag at half mast, and you don't understand what that means. Um, but for a dude, right, having your flag at half mast whew, can be a problem. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not actually talking about a flag. You guys understand that? You see what I did there? If your flag is at half mast and you're tired of it. I got something for you. It's called Blue Chew. B L U E C H E W dot com. They happen to be the sponsor for this episode of Cleared Hot. So if you go to bluechew.com, and why should you go there? Let's talk about it. Your flag's at half mast, right? Maybe you're getting a little bit older. Maybe, maybe things aren't going the way that you want them to in the bedroom. That's right. We're talking about S E X earmuffs. Parents, if you're letting kids listen to this for like the next 60 seconds. Here's the deal. And I've said this from the very beginning. I could not pass up this sponsor because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I've never used anything like this, but I tell you what, I did go through this actual process. So why would you want to do this? What would you need Blue Chew for? It's the first ever chewable that brings you the same performance as Viagra and Cialis. It's got the same active ingredients, so you know it's going to work. It's chewable, so they work faster than taking an actual pill. You can take them anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach. And it's cheaper than those uh, other two, Viagra and Cialis. So it is kind of a no-brainer. And I went through the process. It couldn't have been easier. Uh, I got my discreet package delivered to my house on Friday. Um, I haven't opened it yet because my wife told me not to. Just being honest, God, I hope she doesn't listen to this. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's told me to just go ahead and put those things back in my office and we can readdress that at some other time. But the point being, you don't have to go to the doctor's office because I know personally that I would not be able to walk up to a doc and be like, uh, hey, doc, you see that You see the flag outside of your office there? See how it's at half, half staff? M me too. I'm having those same issues. I'd have a problem with that. I uh, I'm not the most outgoing person in the world when it comes to those things. I would say I'm a little bit shy. So if you're in the same boat, you don't need to go to the doctor's office. Uh, you don't need to hang out around other people who might be having the same issues. It just comes straight to your mailbox. So go to bluechew.com, B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W dot C-O-M, and put in the uh, the code HOT. And what you're going to get, you're going to get your free, first order is going to be free. And you're just going to pay the shipping. For me, I think it was like six dollars and forty-three cents. For most people, it's going to be around five bucks. It's prescribed by a doctor. You go through the whole thing online. Shows up at your house. I, to be honest, it couldn't have been an easier process. I will report back later at another time about its effectiveness. Now, on to some military questions. 
Got about 90 minutes of military Q&A. Episode 42, strap in. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on, win it, man, give it to me, I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's dig into this. Pure military Q&A. I pulled all these questions from Instagram and Twitter. I was not able to answer all of them. I think I got well over probably about 100, but I did the best I could. I grabbed as many as I could, so let's dig right in. Question number uno. In today's media world, it is hard to remain a quiet professional, even if you want to. What do you say to those that criticize SOF, Special Operations Forces, and in this case, they mean retired or ex-individuals that came from that community who are public figures. Are they jealous? Well, I would say it's probably hard to remain quiet, but it's not hard to remain professional. Uh, there's varying degrees of criticism. And I would say that if you look at the broad scope of people who come from the special operations background, some receive little to no criticism whatsoever, and some of them receive what I would say is nearly constant criticism. Internally, now I, I can only speak for the SEAL community, and actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go even further than that. I can only speak for myself. I can give you my opinion when I am talking about all of these military questions, I only speak for myself. I don't speak for the military. So these are just my opinion. And I'm going to base this all off the community that I came from because I have no right to speak about any other community. So in the SEAL community, at least internally, when you're talking about these individuals who are public figures, the largest criticism that I hear internally is, and the largest issue that the guys have or the largest thing that the guys take issue with is deviation from the truth. And what most people would call is selling the trident. The trident is the metal pin that you get awarded. You wear it on the left breast of your uniform and inside of the Navy, it designates you as a seal. It wasn't created by any one individual that I know of. It was created by the community and it's not owned by the individuals. It's owned by the community. And I'm not talking about IP. I'm just talking about in general. It's a symbol of the community. It's not an individual symbol. And when I say selling the trident or the term most often used internally would be pimping the trident. It's the individual that leads with and closes with every sentence. Hey, when I was a seal or every sticker or image has a trident on it somewhere. From what I've seen, if people are unprofessional or they're arrogant or irresponsible and especially untruthful, in my opinion, they deserve every ounce of criticism that they're getting. And they also don't deserve your attention. Reality being changing your clothes doesn't change the person who you are. And the people who are the public figures who are receiving the most criticism often had severe issues while they were serving. The SEAL teams is a very small pond. Uh, and some examples, I'll give you some specific examples that I know off the top of my head. Uh, Grishans, Grishans, whatever, however the hell you say his name. Uh, the governor that's resigning because he had uh, sexual misconduct in an affair. He took a picture, basically, from what I can read, uh, essentially took a woman hostage for a little bit and tried to blackmail her, in addition to some other issues. Clay Tippins, Brandon Webb. Now, externally... Those individuals are receiving a lot of criticism for who they are and who they portray themselves to be. Inside of the SEAL teams, they had issues. They had really big issues because it's a small pond. Now they're operating in an environment where they can control the narrative and they can mask who they were inside of that small pond because they're not in it anymore. They lead with SEAL and they want you to make assumptions. The reason that they lead with the term SEAL is that they want you to assume that they were something that they were not. They want you to believe the hype and the mystique. 
And what I would say is it's not an issue of people being jealous. If I had to pick a word from the community where the lot of the criticism is coming from, it's disappointment, not jealousy. Question two, what is my favorite military issue bullet firing weapon? I'm going to have to go with the 300 Win Mag sniper rifle. And I know that they've gone forward since my day serving and they're shooting things like 338 Lapuas and all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, for myself, I was never, I never got ridiculously into bullets or guns. If the gun went bang and it hit what I was aiming at, then it was an awesome gun. And as far as the bullets, I know people really start to nerd out about the weight and the type. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things that you can do when it comes to both weapons and ammunition. It is certainly a rabbit hole that you can go down on both. I never did. I took my bullets out of the boxes that they got issued in and I went to the armory and I picked up my weapons and did what I needed to do with them. Of all the ones that I ever touched, the 300 Win Mag to me was just a badass rifle. Uh, throw a suppressor on that thing, a variable power scope, and you can reach out and touch somebody and do some serious damage. And then I was thinking about it. The one weapon that I really enjoyed early in my career that they eventually phased out was the M60. That machine gun, you had one choice with this bad boy, full auto, was amazing. I just liked the way it sounded. I liked the way that it looked, its cyclic rate of fire. It just had this very unique pace that it fires. And when you get a couple people who have those machine guns and they start working together, we used to call it singing. One would fire, pop, 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 and then the other one would fire, pop, 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 pop. It just, I don't know. It's something that sticks with you once you've been around it for a little bit. And they eventually replaced it. I think it was a 249. I was never a automatic weapons gunner. I only had... I was around it and I had enough experience with it that I could use it in case that I needed to pick it up and use it. So I never had a crazy amount of experience with the 60 or the 249. Uh, couldn't tell you which one is better, but I missed the M60. Plus, I also believe Rambo used to fire it one handed, and how can you beat that? All right, next question Can anything be done to reduce the burden on families of service members without sacrificing, sacrificing operational effectiveness? i.e. reduce the divorce rate? Well, in my opinion, the dynamics of a military relationship are always going to be a little bit different. There are long stretches apart. In those long stretches apart, there's often going to be sporadic communication. And there's going to be high stress. And I don't think those issues are incredibly unique to the military. I would say uh, if you have a atypical job, typical being you work from nine to five and no value judgment either way on whatever type of job that you have. But if you're able to come home every single night, often that's the majority of your schedule and you have an easy use of communication and you're used to being with your family in you know, the mornings and the evenings and you're at work in the middle and it's a routine, uh, there will there is a different dynamic. If you're a police officer or a firefighter who is a little bit more of a coming and going, there's there's just challenges with that. The military, I think, it just adds a little bit more because of the length of deployments. There are some things that can be done, though, to answer the question, I think. Uh, and the best thing that you can do is support the families, in my opinion. It's the support structure designed for the family. And when I joined pre-9-11, and I would say probably all the way up until maybe 2005, 2006, I didn't hear a lot about this. And then after that time period, it really became a focus, or it certainly seemed like it was a place where they were spending a lot of time and a lot of money. And some things that they changed on both sides, one for the guys coming back from overseas, it's called TLD or third location decompression. Instead of coming straight home from wherever it is you were on deployment, and maybe you were in an incredibly high stress environment, maybe you weren't. Instead of bringing that back to your family, they would send you to a different location. Uh, the location I'm familiar with the most is somewhere in Germany. I actually never was able to do one, but from what I heard, it was a healthy stop to blow off steam in an environment where your life wasn't at risk. 
which is definitely going to help you when you get home. In addition to that, they started doing pre-deployment retreats where they would take the entire family structure, kids, spouses. They would go somewhere else. They would have a network there for child support and basically classes and opportunities to integrate with your spouse, um, work together, try to create some tools for dealing with things while you're gone. Then you go on deployment and they do another one, a post-deployment retreat, repeating the same process as you got back. Like I said, it didn't exist when I joined, uh, but it certainly seems to be the focus now. And I think that it's a step in the right direction. To me, if you want to make the operators more lethal, one of the best things that you can do is support their family structure and network back at home. So it clears up some hard drive space in between their ears and they can go forth overseas and do continue to do the things that they're doing, but they're worrying a little bit less about what's happening at home because it certainly is on your mind. Uh, the long-term impact of that, I think it remains to be seen, but if I were king for a day, that's where I would continue to invest my time, effort, and money to support the families. In a lot of movies, the relationship between the CIA and special forces, uh, and this, I'm going to stop here before I continue answering this question. Uh, special forces, when people ask questions about this or they talk about this, it's important to understand that special forces is in and of itself a specific job inside of the special operations community. So the Green Berets uh, are considered, or they're not considered, their job and their title is special forces. So if you say the relationship between the CIA and special, for special forces, what you're actually saying is the relationship between the agency and the Green Berets. If you mean the larger special operations community as a whole, make sure you say that. Confused often, uh, but I got nothing but respect for the Green Berets, so I always bring this up when people uh, make this mistake. It's not a big deal, uh, but it helps with clarity with what you're talking about. So the relationship between the CIA and special operations is dramatic and negative. Is this just creative license, or is there some kernels of truth? I would say it's mostly creative license. The people that I interfaced with were intelligent and they were extremely capable. And if this does come from anywhere, if there are kernels of truth to this, I would say it probably came from a time that was pre-9-11. There was much less cooperation and collaboration, and that is true not just between interagencies, but between inner services. I mean, we did not really talk much with the other branches, and we certainly didn't talk that much with the other special operations communities. And in my opinion, it was based on the fact that we were competing for budget and we didn't really have an active role to play that many places overseas. So in addition to competing for budget, you were competing for jobs. That ended up, I would say, biting us in the ass for a few years post 9-11 because it took a while for us to start integrating. And I think if you read like the 9-11 Commission Report, the lack of collaboration and communication between government agencies and organizations also played a huge role in what allowed 9-11, the events of 9-11 to actually take place. And a lot of that changed. So I didn't interface with these individuals until post 9-11. And like I said, the people that I interface with, incredibly intelligent and extremely capable. Uh, when it comes to movies, having done a little bit of technical advising work, what it comes down to is that you're always trying to find a balance between authenticity and entertainment. If it comes down to it, more often than not, what I have seen, they're going to go with entertainment versus authenticity because it's entertainment that puts butts in the seats and allows them to, we were talking about TV shows to sell the things on the ad break. And when it comes to movies, you know, make their money back on what it costs to produce the actual movie itself. It's more entertaining and dramatic to portray it as a negative, tenuous relationship. Uh, but what I'll say is that negative, tenuous relationship is, from the agency people I know, it's, it's nothing like their movie portrayals. This individual had two questions. The second one was, thoughts on retired special operations joining private military contractors. Did I consider it? I did not consider it. But as far as guys and gals from the community joining the 
military contractors, it makes sense. Uh, they're a really good fit in quite a few ways. For one, most, if not all, the training is already done. And they have the experience that is precisely what the contractor is looking for. It's an easy transition for a lot of the guys. And I say that because often the human resources from those organizations is closely tied to the individuals from prior communities. From what I've seen, there are some organizations that are heavy on the Army side. There's some organizations that are heavy on the Navy side, heavy on the Marine Corps side. And what it does is it creates an avenue or an opportunity for people to retire, but still essentially a lot of the times it seems like do the same or similar job with the same or similar people. The pay is going to be comparable. It's often going to be a little bit better depending on your skill set and background. And it makes sense. I, I understand why guys do it for sure. Like I said, I did not consider it as an option in the way I thought about it, when I moved on from the military, I wanted my life to be differently. And the, I guess the metaphor I would use would be for myself, when I hung the spurs up, I just wanted to leave them hung up. And there's reasons for that. From my view in the cheap seats, having never been a contractor, uh, I enjoyed the support structure of the military. I liked what I did, but I also liked the support structure behind it. If things went south, essentially, damn near everything would stop if you called for help, and you and what was going on with you would become the focus, and all the assets would be directed and allocated towards you. I'm not sure that exists in the private contractor world. I also enjoyed the selection process of the military. Uh, there's a vast and wild difference in backgrounds and experience and competence in some of these companies, and I would prefer to work with known quantities and not hope for the best. Uh, there's an extreme difference in the contracting world in, in capability and also what these companies are tasked with doing. Some of them are incredibly highly vetted that are filled with the tip of the spear individuals. Some of them, that is not the case. And the individuals that you're going to work with and for in that broad spectrum of organizations is going to vary. And it's just, it's not something that I wanted to deal with. I figured I would be better served to move on and do something else with my time, effort, and energy. This is a good one. This question, I get this one uh, pretty often, actually. Do new SEALs get any say in which team they're assigned to after initial training. So again, I can only speak from the experience I had many, many moons ago. And my experience was that we sat down one day in third phase, which is the last phase of BUDS, and we wrote what was called a wish list. On my wish list, I put down SEAL Team 2, 4, and 8. You had three choices. The reason I did that, I was born and raised in Santa Cruz, California, and I had spent most of my life on the West Coast, and I wanted to go check out the East Coast. That was the true motivation behind it. The team I got, uh, and then the next, what was it? Probably a month from then, we were out on San Clemente Island getting ready to really be done with buds. And, of course, they if they're going to give you any good information, it needs to be negatively reinforced. So we all broke up into the groups that we were going to be moving on to our teams with after buds. And, you know, splashed around in the water a little bit, played some games in the sand. And they would call your name and you would be added to a group and then they would come down the line and tell you which team you were going to. So I put down two, four, and eight. That was my wish list. I was sent to SEAL Team 5. A term people need to know and understand when you're in the Navy, specifically in the SEAL teams, is the needs of the Navy. If your desire and the Navy's needs are the same, you're probably going to get what you want. If they're not, you're going to go where you go. No, in my opinion, no difference between the even number teams and the odd number teams other than when they're geographically located. So it doesn't really matter. If you're at this point in your career and you're wanting to go to a particular team and you don't get to go there, don't sweat it. Do the best job you can. And you're going to have an incredible amount of latitude and ability to direct your career post your first tour. So do SEALs get any say in which team they're assigned to? 
they get to say which team they want to go to, but I don't think they have any say in where they actually go. All right. This question's a good one as well. Can I provide some examples of poor and great leadership in the teams? I think it's easier for me to answer this question instead of giving specific examples uh, to kind of list the traits or repetitive themes that I saw happening time and time again on both sides of this coin, both bad and good. For me, it is easier to point out bad leadership than good because bad leadership often looks like a catastrophic failure. Good leadership often looks like a smooth and seamlessly running machine. And you sit back and you watch like, damn, how did that person do that? It's a little bit harder to point out and to pick out because a train wreck is easier to identify than cars just cruising down the freeway. But here we go. Here's some things that I saw in the pro and the con side of the house. So let's go with poor leadership qualities and things that I saw time and time again. I have kind of a list written down here for you. And I have, I'm thinking of specific individuals and specific instances when I kind of read through this, but I'm not going to give you the names of the individuals because one, that's just not fair. And two, it's, it, it doesn't make the point any better. So the first thing I saw often, if not every single time when it came to poor leadership, these are some character traits that I saw. One was emotional responses. Instead of analytical objective, objective thinking, emotion almost always dictated action. Arrogance, ego, hubris, constantly acting like the smartest person in the room, flattening the chain of command, which I'll explain here in a minute, and micromanaging. For whatever reason, I constantly and consistently saw people with poor leadership ability falling into that list of characteristics. And often, those lists of characteristics, even inside of the SEAL teams, were paired with average performance at best, and often subpar performance. So you got a guy who's barely is hanging on when it comes to capacity and capability with his peers, if not holding up the group that he's supposed to be leading, but with an attitude, with ego, with incredibly emotional responses. Uh, An example I'll give you of why that's dangerous or one that sticks out to me in my mind is we were in a trading evolution at San Clemente Island. And this comes down to flattening the chain of command. And sometimes we'll do things that are time sensitive called a TST or a time sensitive target. This was a training evolution. There was actually nothing time sensitive about it, except for the fact that there was a clock and we were given a limited amount of time to plan. And it wasn't that much time, but that's fine. This particular individual had a group of 16 to 18 SEALs working for him that had a vast amount of experience, exponentially more than himself. And the job of a leader, I hope everybody realizes, is to lead. It is not to do your people's jobs for you. And really the job of the leader is to keep your chin up, to keep your head up and out, and keep your eyes on the bigger picture. Your foot soldiers, the people working for you, they're the ones who are in the trenches. And you need to check in with them to the degree that you are aware of what they're doing and you're ensuring that they're driving the train in the direction that you want it to go to meet your commander's intent and your guidance. But you don't want to do their jobs. And if you have a large group of people working for you, the odds that they have a cumulative amount of experience and knowledge that exceeds yours is really, really really high. So this individual was not an experienced individual, but what he had was a caller device that was higher in rank than everybody else. And when we were tasked with something that was time sensitive, instead of reaching out and leading his his organization and empowering his people, he flattened the chain of command. So what does that mean? He solicited no input and no advice. Instead of leading, he just started telling people what they were going to do. And he was wrong on almost every single front. So what happened when we went and did the conducted the training exercise? 
It was ugly. It was trash and it was garbage. And the guys didn't really have any clue what was going on because they weren't involved in the planning process. They didn't understand the why of what it is that they were doing. And he looked like a jackass, which shouldn't surprise anyone because he was a jackass uh, who eventually got fired. But the people who really suffered were the people that worked for him. And that's the danger of terrible, well, just bad leadership in general. I would use terrible when I'm talking about this individual, but just bad leadership in general is your people are going to suffer. Now, on the other side of that coin, what have I seen from people who I would consider to have great leadership characteristics? It's, it's kind of the opposite of the list that I gave you at the beginning of this question. They have control of their emotions at all times. You're not going to see these people as a sine wave of emotion where they're peaks and valleys. If anything, they're just kind of riding it out. Uh, you might be getting shot at. You might be sitting on a bar stool having a conversation. They're cool, calm, collected. They're even keeled. Their focus is on the mission and the men. It's not on themselves. They empower subordinates. Instead of acting like they're the smartest person in the room, they realize that there's no possible way that they are the smartest person in the room, even though I, I take that back. It is possible that they could be the smartest person in the room. But think about this from the perspective of somebody listening to me talk right now. Do you want to work for somebody who knows that they're the smartest person in the room, acts like they're the smartest per in the person in the room, and has no interest in your input or soliciting that input from you because of how they feel about themselves, right? that ego and arrogance? No, nobody wants to. So even the really smart people that I've worked for, and it's not hard for me to find somebody who's smarter than me, just about everybody I've ever worked for is, they empower their people and they focus on accomplishing the mission and leading their team there, not doing the job of the people that are working for them. So they keep their focus up and out. They don't have ego attached to plans. They don't really care if they're the one who had the idea for the plan. They care about whether or not the plan is successful. The best leaders I've ever seen, they take the time and are willing to teach, but they're more importantly, they're willing to learn themselves. And one of the best examples, uh, probably one of the most impactful leaders that I had was an enlisted guy, actually a senior enlisted guy when I was on the East Coast. And we would often have to plan, you know, we would go on these large training exercises, but somebody has to plan those things. And that usually came from inside of the element. And pretty early on in my time there, I was tasked with doing the main planning of a very large training evolution that the entire squadron was going to go to. And my boss essentially said, listen, I'm going to task you with doing this. I'm always here for you if you have questions, but I don't want you to come to me with questions until you've done everything you possibly can on your own to figure it out for yourself. So he gave me enough rope that I had latitude. I totally could have hung myself if I was irresponsible but I knew that he was always there in case I needed the help. And the last thing I wanted to do was let him down or the people that I was working with down. And it's a perfect example of mentorship right there. Instead of telling me how I was going to do the planning and what I needed to do, he gave me a broad framework. I had the end state in mind of what I was clearly defined, what the end state was. I knew why I was doing it. And I knew I had somebody that I can go to if I needed to ask questions. And then I was empowered to go make decisions. And it was awesome. And I've tried to repeat that in the people that I had working for me later in my career and even in my own kids. There's no value in telling your kids, this is how you're going to do something. This is how much time you have to do it. And there's incredible value when they come to you and say, hey, dad, uh, how do I do this? And you say, well, I don't know. I'm here to help you, but let's go try to figure this out together. And you let them lead and figure out their way as opposed to doing it for them. All right, next question. What was the biggest physical trait, good runner, swimmer, shooter, etc., that you noticed that all high-performing SEALs had in common? I have a question back at this individual who asked this, and that would be high-performing at what? You mean just in general as a SEAL operator? Uh, that's what I'll base it off of. It just, I guess, would be well-rounded SEAL operator. Um, so in the community, there are people who are phenomenal swimmers, runners, shooters. 
And you'll find often that there are individuals who are great at really, really good at one thing, um, but they're not they're not what I would call well-rounded or great SEALs. They're specialists instead of generalists. And in the SEAL community, you are much more of a generalist than you are a specialist. Uh, and I can't think of a single physical trait that's going to give you an advantage. Most guys are average height. I'd say 5'10 is probably average for most guys. Six foot on the high end. Of course, you're going to get some total bean poles up there that are in the mid sixes. Uh, and then you have hobbits like Josh Bridges, who's actually four foot six. Uh, and their build is, is going to vary, but it's average. I mean, I'd say probably slightly more muscular than most, but there's plenty of guys that I know, again, who are just bean pole thin and tall and short and skinny as well. Like it, It's really tough to put your thumb on one specific character trait, um, physically at least. For me, if I had to point out one trait that I saw when I looked at well-rounded SEAL operators, um, the highest performing SEALs, to use the same vernacular as this question, it would be intelligence. Uh, the ability to solve problems, specifically nonlinear problems. Um, there's just too many physical tasks that we're required to do and specialization in any one area, meaning you can run a four minute mile, but you can't really pick up anything that's heavy, or you can just pick up incredibly heavy stuff and you can't run to save your life. That's not really a great idea. The real world doesn't reward that very well. Uh, so I would say average physical ability, but above average ability in between the ears. That's, and I know the question was based around physical traits, but I just can't give you one that is going to give you an indicator of success later on in your career. Speaking about careers, the next question is, any advice whether to go in as an officer out of college or just enlist out of college if you want to go into special operations? What I'll say is I think both are great options. You could have a incredibly rich and rewarding career either way that you went, but understand that the path would be a little bit different. If you go directly to being an officer, you are going to start your career in a leadership role because of the fact of what your uniform and collar device says. You're going to be a commissioned officer. You're going to be expected to conduct yourself as such. You are going to have, if you look at, if you compare the officer operational career to the enlisted operational career on the officer side of the house, if you go in directly as an officer, it will be shorter. Uh, you're going to start off maybe as a third officer, and if there is no third officer spot, you might start off as an AOIC, or the assistant officer in charge, basically the second in command of a maneuver element. But let's say that uh, there's some additional officers around, you can start off as a third officer, which in my opinion is the best spot for the officers to begin because there's less responsibility and more opportunity to gain experience while not being under the magnifying glass and the, the thumb of pressure. But after that third O, you will become an AOIC. And that after that AOIC too, you are tour, you are going to become an officer in charge. Now, on the officer side of the house, you still have the ability to go into the field after your OIC tour, but I will say it is limited. You're going to move up into a role after your OIC tour of probably a troop commander. And if you're in the troop commander position, you're not looking down the sights of your gun at all. And reality is, as an OIC, it's unlikely that you will be as well, because that's not your job. Your job is to lead your men and to get those men into a position where they can look down the sights of their rifle. Beyond troop commander on the officer side of the house, you're starting to look at things like an operations officer, probably an executive officer, which is the second in command of a command, and then the commanding officer. All of those roles are largely administrative in nature. So that's what you kind of, that's the progression for, for officers. Now you will probably have more diversity of experience and roles. If you go to the officer side of the house, you're going to have to do joint tours. You're going to have to do detached tours. And they, although they don't sign, sound as exciting and they don't sound as sexy, there's a lot of good experience that comes from those things. If you go in uh, as an enlisted soldier with a college degree, you will have a position initially that is not going to be tied directly to leadership. 
you're going to be expected to lead because of the nature of the career, but your caller device isn't going to put you in charge of a maneuver element. You're going to have a larger or longer operational window. Uh, and I think it'll give you a better behind the scenes view of military life, you know, essentially how the sausage is made. And your degree doesn't expire. You can always commission later on. You could work your way through the enlisted ranks as far as you wanted to. And then at any point in time, you can get a commission because your degree doesn't expire. Then you can work your way through the officer uh, rank progression, starting at that third O or AOIC with all of your previous experience and understanding of the military system. You take all of that with you, and it has been my experience. I've worked with for some great officers who came directly in, through, whether through a service academy or ROTC or OCS, and came directly into the military as an officer. Believe me, I've worked for many that are phenomenal. But in my experience, the people who have more time in the military and more understanding of how the military system works, they're better able to navigate it, and their people benefit from that as well. So again, both options are great. Just understand the differences between the two. Next question. Did I ever work with James Hatch? I did work with James Hatch, but I called him Jimmy. Uh, and we used to jump together back probably in the early 2000s. And I know he just wrote a book about his journey from being injured overseas uh, until I think you believe you call it, it's called Touching the Dragon, I believe. Um I'm familiar with what happened to him and very peripherally familiar with what he went through. I know it was dark, and I have no doubt that the book uh, would be a great read. Uh, Jimmy's a good dude. I haven't touched base with him in a long time, but I hope he's doing well. Next question. Best advice for someone aspiring to be an officer in the Navy? And I'll add to this that this advice applies to any branch. doesn't matter if it's just the Navy. How to earn and keep the respect of your subordinates, peers, and superiors. And I would say don't call them your superiors. They're just your senior officers. Because believe me, they often will not be superior to you. So my advice, anybody looking to or aspiring to become an officer in any branch of the military. First and foremost, take your time. Do not rush into a job that you aren't prepared for. If you feel like you just have to go in right now, I would say that you probably should just take a knee for a second, take a breath, and make sure that you are actually ready, willing, and able to do the job that you're rushing towards. If you decide that you do, in fact, want to head in that direction, by all means do so. The last thing I'm trying to do is talk anybody out of military service, but I'll say if you're going to go in and you want to be an officer and earn the respect of the people that work for you and around you, both above and below you in the chain of command, Embrace your weaknesses. Once you realize where your shortcomings are and you're in a leadership position, find people who are better than you and staff your weaknesses with those people. Empower them to do the job so you can do your job, which is to actually lead. Be very quick to listen and very slow to speak. You need to measure your words. Don't go into this job running off at the mouth. Do not go into the job rushing to be cavalier. Instead, you need to focus on getting your job done. You need to deliver every single time because the things that come out of your mouth, the words that you say, they need to mean something. You need to develop relationships with your peers above you and below you in the chain of command. And you need to do that because you have to develop trust with the individuals that you work with and the individuals that you work for. And then once you have that trust, the most important thing you need to do is to maintain it. Trust and integrity, in my opinion, from my own experience, when I, when I look at the people that I have lost trust and integrity with, I, it can be difficult. Um, and I don't even know if that word encapsulates it. it. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to recover once it's lost. So in your journey... Uh, to become an officer and to earn the respect of your subordinates and your peers, you're going to, you're going to fuck up, right? And you need to own those failures when you do, do not make excuses. If you make a mistake, own your mistake and don't take two weeks to own your mistake, own it immediately. 
And so don't look for excuses. Don't make excuses. Instead, just look for solutions. And when you uh, succeed, when your team succeeds and the people who are working for you succeed, you need to reward them. So give the credit to the team when you're successful. And when the team fails, you need to own that as the leader of the team. And that's the best uh, advice that I can give you or anybody who's looking to become an officer in the military. Next question. How did you prepare mentally for combat prior to operations? Also a good question. These were some, uh, some good ones coming out of left field that I was a little surprised by. So for me, again, I can only speak for myself. Personally, I understood or I ensured that I understood the plan. And not only did I understand the overarching plan, I specifically understood my role in that plan. And I took that upon myself. I didn't wait for somebody to come in and explain to me my role. It was my job to understand what my role was and how I integrated with the larger plan. So for me, one thing that I focused on often uh, was studying imagery and intel. Uh, Most of my career, I was walk and point, which means I was the first person in a foot patrol. So I was largely responsible for navigation to and from, and I just personally hate the feeling of being lost. I never enjoy not knowing where I am and which, what direction is which. So when it came to studying imagery and intel, I would spend a lot of time looking at overhead stuff. I would look at terrain. I would look at buildings. And what I was looking for were unique identifiers, ways that I could kind of lift my head up really quickly, identify something that was unique, and immediately put a pin on a map, not figuratively, but liter- uh, literally, but figuratively. So I knew where I was. I just liked that uh, understanding of constantly knowing where I was. So I spent a lot of time studying, depending on how much time we have. Uh, but I would always, I would always do as much as I could to understand the plan and understand my role inside of it. And then when it came a little bit time or closer to game time, uh, I always laid out and put my gear on exactly the same way. And I always carried my items in exactly the same place every single time. And over a career, your gear will change. For most people, it streamlines because you realize early on you're just carrying way too much stuff. And eventually like, wow, I haven't used this ever. So you're out of here. You're fired, piece of gear. And for me, a lot of it was, you know, going through this routine. So I'd lay all my gear out, make sure that I had everything, and I'd put it on exactly the same way. I guess in a large sense, what I was doing was packing my brain, getting ready to roll. And then as far as how did I really prepare mentally or my headspace was going into it, um, I expected violence uh, on every target and every structure and every single room. I thought like a predator. I actively sought danger and threats, not to avoid them, but to engage them. So I went out the door with my brain packed with an understanding of what it is that we were doing, looking for violence looking to be an aggressor, not looking to be a victim. And I would say in the high 90th percentile, the times that I did encounter violence, it was because I initiated it, not when I was on the receiving end. Sometimes you get ambushed, but most of the time I would control when violence would occur. I was the predator and that's the way that I thought. And for the job that I came from, that's the way that you need to think to stay ahead of the game, to stay ahead of your enemy. So understood the plan. I had my gear. And then I went out thinking like a wolf, not thinking like a sheep. All right. This next question is an important one. And I hope a lot of people take this to heart. The question is, what is your opinion of veterans that seem to think that they can do anything because they are a veteran? Example, veteran pulls up to a building to park is told he can't park there and responds with, I'm a veteran. First and foremost, I think 99.9% of veterans would be pissed off at the example you provided. It's the wrong mentality. And if I were there and I heard somebody say that, assuming they weren't like a 98 year old man and a walker, you know, I'm going to play this from the perspective of somebody who's probably in their thirties or forties, like a modern era, somebody serving, I would address it on the spot. I'm not saying I necessarily would chew their ass, but I definitely would engage that individual and do my best to explain to them that their headspace is completely wrong and that their attitude is completely wrong. Service and a sense of entitlement should not walk hand in hand. All service is honorable. 
but it's not the same. And I say this every time that I talk about service. What I hear often, and you know, this example is a good example of an individual who would talk like this. You know, I'm a vet. You know, I dedicated my life to fight for your freedom. And I don't know why I'm making a different noise for that voice. You know, but I hear, I hear people talk like this. You know, I fought for your freedom. You know, you don't understand the things that I did. Well, here's the deal. Like I said, all service is honorable and it's not all the same. Some people fought their asses off and some people didn't fight at all. And it's important to recognize that you can't have one without the other. I'm going to get into this in a question a little bit later on. But the people who have the job responsibility to engage with an enemy in direct combat cannot do their job without the individuals and organizations that support them in that role. You cannot have one without the other. Depending on which side of that coin you're on, it doesn't matter. It's not a measure of the value of your service. Whether or not you fought is not a measure of the value of your service. But how you act and describe what you did and your service is a measure of your integrity. Just remember that enlisting or joining the military in the modern area is voluntary. It was a complete choice. There has not been a draft in decades. No one owes you a goddamn thing for your choice. Don't expect thank yous and don't look for handouts. You know, you hear people, you know, I went to war. I sacrificed. And yes, you did. You absolutely did do those things. But you also absolutely chose to do those things. And don't forget that. Did you make those choices? Did you choose to enlist? Did you choose to pursue an occupation that deployed overseas because you wanted people to say thank you? Is, I mean, was that the underlying motivating factor for what it is that you did? I don't think most people would say, yes, that's why they joined. I don't think anybody would say that. And if you did, I think you joined for the wrong reasons. Being a veteran is a privilege. And it's also a term associated with your past. Don't let it take over your life and dictate your future. Don't be the guy that leads and closes every sentence with it. Be thankful for it and do something amazing with it. Don't live in the past. Might as well continue on to the question that I think ties into this a little bit. Can I share the importance of non-combat arms roles? My son joined in a medical surgical role and keeps saying he's going to volunteer for SF. In this case, I think he means special forces because this individual probably comes from that background, because he says, and follow in my footsteps, dot, dot, dot. Not a fan of that for many reasons. Let's start with, it's. I understand why people who join the military can get a little bit disillusioned. It, it's easy to become disillusioned, especially when the focus always seems to be elsewhere. It's easy to become disillusioned when you lose sight of the impact that you actually have. All of the subject matter of every single movie, book, and TV show would not be possible without enablers, enablers, period, without exception. From the stats that I have seen, 10 to 15% of the military and all four branches or all the service branches are actually tasked with direct contact or direct engagement with the enemy. The rest of the military roles and responsibilities are not by design. That's not in their job description. But let's think about it from the perspective of the subject matter, right, of some of those books. And let's go to specifically the Operation Neptune Spear, which was the capture, or not so much, kill of Osama bin Laden. Obviously, everybody knows that that happened. But let's think about for a second what actually made that possible. There were the individuals on the ground who were there to clear the compound, clear the structure, clear room by room. And that was their role and responsibility. They had a lot of things with them that they were not directly responsible for. So let's start small and let's work big here. The bullets they shot, the guns they were carrying, their body armor and their uniforms their helmets, their night vision. Somebody is responsible for sourcing and developing and equipping all of those individuals. Then you go a little bit bigger. The helicopters, 
the drones that were overhead, the AC-130s, the mechanics that are involved with all three of those things, the pilots, the air crew, the military aircraft and the airlift that got them overseas in the first place, the intel analysts that crunched through the metadata and all the information and you know maintained a laser-like focus for a decade to find this individual, the interpreters, the communication gear, the talk and the jock, uh, the tactical operations center or joint operations center personnel, the communication back and forth between those, all of the administration or admin requirements that were, you know, in addition to all the combat stuff, you, you, you never lose sight of the admin requirements. If you take any one of those pieces away, that mission doesn't happen. Take the helicopters away from you know the, those supporting assets. Take the helicopters away from the maneuver element. Guess what? You're not maneuvering on anything. Take the intel analysts away and the intel specialists away. Guess what? You're not going anywhere. Combat MOSs, jobs like being SEALs, uh, jobs like being Marine Recon or uh, a member of an ODA, Special Forces Ranger, you are a spoke in the wheel. The reality is the U.S. military could have easily killed Osama bin Laden without the SEAL teams. But the SEAL team that went there that night could not have killed him without the robust support network of the military structure. Like I said, you take any one of those pieces out, we kind of fall flat on our face. Not because we're incapable. Well, actually, I guess it would be because we are incapable. We need all those support elements to make us able to do our job. You take the bullets and the guns away, I, I'm i not going to you know, scream at somebody until they die. And I'm not really interested in getting into a knife fight. You have to have both. You have to have the support network the enablers, the support community and the commands, and then the direct warfighters as well. You cannot have one without the other. The problem is all of the focus is on the people who were in the compound that day. And it does a disservice to what makes it possible to get to that compound in the first place. So if you are in the military and you're not in a role that is the subject matter of a book or a movie or a TV show. One, be thankful. You're not missing out on anything. But two, realize that all of these shiny objects that people focus on, they wouldn't be possible at all, ever, unless you do your job as well. Next question. What is the best and worst thing you learned while you were in the military? Let's start with the worst. The thing that frustrated me the most uh, was the realization that the military is a massive bureaucracy and it is quite frankly highly political at its top at its apex and that does trickle down and it can be felt the reason i say it's political is because it actually is largely political you start getting up into the stratosphere of you know admirals and generals i would equate those individuals more to politicians often than i would actually soldiers because that's who they are interfacing with the most often. Paired with that, uh, the realization that I think everybody in uniform eventually makes, wearing a uniform can't hide the person underneath. And by that I mean that everybody joins for different reasons. Um, I joined, I would say, for uh, idealistic reasons. I thought the military was probably a little bit more pure than it ended up being, and that's completely and utterly my fault. That was my perception going into it. Uh, I was very naive about it when I was young. Not everybody joins out of pure sense of wanting to fight for the country. And I've said this many times. Some people, they want to change their perspective. Some people, they want to take advantage of the educational benefits. Some people want to change their socioeconomic status. And that military is a great thing for all of those people to come together and to work together. You just will eventually realize that some people are in it for different reasons. And that's totally fine. Like I said, that was on me. Um, and I wouldn't put that down as one of the worst things. It was just something that I had to come to grips with. The bureaucracy and understanding the bureaucracy was definitely probably one of the worst aspects of the military. As far as the best aspects of the military, the best things that I learned while I was in. The cool thing about the military is that everyone, regardless of which service you go to, you're going to get some exposure to discipline, to work ethic, to leadership, to integrity, you're going to get to travel. You're going to get to expose yourself 
more than likely to things that are other than first world, which I believe to be incredibly important because it allows you to uh, develop a more enhanced perspective of the world you're going to be returning back to. So you're going to, I think all military services are going to give you a taste of all of those things. And those are, in my opinion, the single best thing that I learned. It didn't come from that for me. And again, I speak only for me. The thing that I find to be the most important, the best thing that I learned while I was in the military, I learned to appreciate my freedom. I learned that if you don't use your freedom, the freedoms we are so amazingly lucky and fortunate to have in this country, it's meaningless. When I joined and through my career, I gave up my time. I gave up my ability to speak freely when I wanted to on the topics that I wanted to. I gave up my ability to pursue the passions that I may have discovered along the way. I gave up my ability to push my personal boundaries outside of military service, and I gave up my calendar. Holidays, birthdays, special occasions. If I could be home for it, that was great. If I needed to be elsewhere, well, then that's where I went because I surrendered my calendar to something else. What I really learned is that I am the luckiest person on the face of the earth. I wake up every morning in the first world. I wake up every morning with really zero concerns for survival. Yes, I know and I understand that there are drastically varying living conditions in the U.S. and in the first world. What I'm saying is we don't spend our waking moments consumed with thoughts of food, water, and shelter, for the most part. We don't spend our lives in bombed-out homes, living amongst the rubble where your family members are buried underneath, but you're unwilling to leave them, so you instead eke out an existence in the worst environments imaginable on the face of the earth. I understand that there are people in the first world who are struggling, But those people in the first world who are struggling, let's be honest, they have it so much better than the people in the third or fourth world that are also struggling. And it's important not to forget that. It's important not to forget that we in the first world have boundless opportunity in front of us at all times. So what I learned is that we, the first world, we won the lottery. Now, look at what happens to most people who won the lottery. They end up broke. Why is that? Well, they didn't work for it, for one. So they didn't develop an appreciation for what they have. And they have no responsibility for what they have. What does responsible freedom look like? To me, the lesson, again, that I learned, the best lesson that I learned in the military, I need to be responsible with my freedom. And to me, that means I have to use it. It looks like getting off your ass. It looks like putting down a bag of chips and picking up a goddamn dumbbell. It looks like going outside, going for a walk, going for a hike, going for a run, going out and exploring the vast nature of what it is that we have in this country. It looks like seeking diversity of thought. It looks like talking to people and listening to them. And that doesn't mean you have to agree. It's okay to talk to somebody that doesn't share your opinion and not argue with them and to just listen and at the end of the day decide that you don't agree with them. No problem. We're fortunate and lucky to have the ability to do that. Responsible freedom to me, it looks like traveling. It looks like getting in your car and marveling at the amazing things that we have in front of us. And to me, it looks like being thankful and appreciative of what we have, not dismissive. It's the single biggest lesson, most important, impactful lesson that I learned in the military. I learned to appreciate the freedoms that we have. Now, this next question ties in perfectly. Are there any negative aspects of your life that you would attribute to your time in the service? And the answer to that is yes. I, there are are not many. But there are a few. And I'll start with, I spend a lot of time away from home. And by that, what I mean is, I spend a lot of time away from my wife. And 
when you're coming and going and you know you have limited time and then there are large periods of time in between communication or physical presence with each other, looking back, this is me retroactively looking back. I don't know if retroactively is the right word, but it's me looking in the rear view mirror. What I find is that we, my wife and I, we often didn't talk about or work our way through things that we should have in the moment. Uh, I know for myself, I can't speak for her, but I know for myself, I definitely took the excuse of now is not the right time for this. I need to stay focused. We'll deal with this later. Well, oftentimes later doesn't necessarily come. And those issues and the things that we should have worked our way through, they don't go away. And they certainly come back. And I, I don't know if I can necessarily say, I'm not blame. I will not blame the issues that we have on the military. They are, they're a consequence of being in the military, but we made the conscious decision not to engage and work our way through them at that point in time. And it sucks because we're doing our best to work our way through those right now. And it's painful. And I wish we would have taken the time in the moment. But, you know, I I talked earlier about dynamics of military relationship. They're going to be different. It's just, it's kind of part of the game. Uh, In addition to that, I would say, if I'm being totally honest, I struggle a little bit with uh, empathy. And I don't mean I'm an autonomous robot. I don't mean that I don't cry or I don't have emotions. I it was hammered into me from an early age that pain is uncomfortable. Uh, but the reality is get up and keep going. You know, the continue. You don't want to be the weakest link. You need to continue to drive forward. Don't let down the people around you. And especially in a combat environment, you know, the number one rule of a gunfight, you could be standing shoulder to shoulder with two of your best friends. And if one of them gets shot in the head and falls next to you, number one rule in a gunfight is win the gunfight. Then you can take care of your friends later. Otherwise, you might become a casualty yourself. And it, I think, over enough time and repetition and experience, it changes some things. And there's some switches that were thrown in my head that I'm working to not unthrow, but to understand the consequences of it. And the empathy side of the house is is one of those things. With that, you know, weakness bothers me as a human being. And I think it bothers me because I hate it in myself because of the things that I just just talked about, the community that I came from and the, and the attitude and environment, the work environment. I, I don't like it in myself, so it irritates the shit out of me when I see it in other people. And that's that's an issue that I need to deal with, not that other people need to deal with. So if there are any negative aspects that I would associate In my life now, from my time in in service, it would be those things. Um, I'm sure there's probably more. Uh, Quite frankly, I just don't feel like going that far down the rabbit hole right now. But I think it's important and essential to talk about uh, the shadow just as much as you talk about the light. Because service in the military is, is a great thing, but there are negative consequences that can come from it as well. Next question. Were the members of Extortion 17, which was a helicopter that was shot down by an RPG in Afghanistan, part of your squadron? And did you serve with Adam Brown? So we'll start with the Extortion 17 side of the house. Uh, Yes, I knew nearly every single member of that helicopter pretty well. Uh, I went through buds with the troop commander. Yeah, that was a rough day. Uh, I was living in San Diego when I got the news that that had happened, and then they slowly started releasing the names. The military will withhold the names of those killed in action. Uh, Notification of next of kin takes priority. They do the absolute best they can to notify the families before the news gets a hold of it, and then once they have notified the families, they will start to release the names. And as the names started to come out, that was was a bad day for me. Um, Every single name had meaning to me and personal relationship to me that particular helicopter and the individuals that were on that helicopter were from the squadron that I was assigned to when I was at development group. And if I had stayed there for a long enough period of time, if I had not left, uh, 
there's a chance I would have been on the helicopter. And there's also a chance I would have moved on and been doing something else there at that command as well. But it's certainly touched uh, very close to home. And we'll just leave it at that. So yeah, I did know them. Now on the Adam Brown side of the house. Yes, I did know Adam Brown, but I did not know him that well. Um, my interaction with him actually occurred when he was going through selection for development group. And I was his instructor on the military free fall side of the house. I have not read Adam's book. I've heard nothing but great things about Adam's book. And I've heard nothing but great things about Adam as a human being and about Adam as an operator. But I personally recommended that Adam not pass the free fall portion of selection. He, there were some issues with Adam. For one, I think the community in general felt bad about what happened to him. And essentially, we do uh, force on force training with ammunition called simunition, which it's basically a wax bullet. I think it's actually plastic. Uh, and the end of it compresses and there's pink or blue or a, a detergent based dye that comes out of it. And it sticks to your uniform and you can tell that you were hit and then you can wash your clothes and doesn't stick to it. Uh, but from my understanding of what happened to him is he was up in the rafters, meaning that there's usually uh, at a large open floor plan and above there's a catwalk so that the cadre can look down and conduct the training and give you a debrief on your actions from a bird's eye view as opposed to looking down the sights of your gun. Adam had eye protection on, which is required in those environments, but he was standing in the catwalks and his simunition round came underneath his pair of glasses and hit him in his right eye. And it severely damaged his right eye. From my understanding, he could not see at all out of his right eye. And that was why I recommended that he not be passed in the free fall stage. Uh, anybody who knows anything about me knows that I love jumping out of airplanes. So anytime I would get a chance to continue to do that, I would go and I would support the, uh, it was called green team back in the day. I would support the green team classes as an air operations instructor and people who are having issues. There's a wild discrepancy in skydiving ability and proficiency and competence inside of the military. Some people jump a lot. Some people never jump and they're constantly flirting with their currency. Uh, I tried to always jump as much as I could because I loved it. So when it came to people who are struggling in the free fall course and by struggling, I mean lack of stability, they would jump out of an airplane and they were not able to control their body. It's a very dangerous environment for the student and you need to have an instructor chasing that student that is capable of grabbing them in free fall as they're falling in an unstable body position, rapidly accelerating and decelerating, and then hopefully be able to save their life. I found the people who were tumbling and the most dangerous in free fall to be the most challenging and the most exciting. So I would essentially volunteer to always jump with those individuals. And Adam was struggling. He was not successfully completing the mandatory go, no go test wickets in the military free fall curriculum. You're usually given two attempts at a jump. If you do not pass the, you know, and a lot of the times all you're required to do is jump out, not turn as you exit the aircraft and conduct some very basic skills while free falling and pull your parachute at the right altitude. Then of course you add gear to that. You add a rucksack, a weapon, oxygen mask, all of those things. Adam was struggling and I had failed him twice on multiple different test gate jumps. But like I said, I think there was some guilt associated with uh, what had happened to him because he was a very good guy. And I hate that fucking term. I hate the term good guy because I know that it was used in this environment. I took it up to the course director uh, that I recommended that he be dropped from training and the course director concurred with me and leadership in the selection and training organization requested that we continue to test Adam because he was such a good guy. So we continued to test Adam and eventually he passed. Uh, and I'm going to use air quotes for he passed. He was able to make his way through the curriculum. He didn't die. Um, he was given more chances than other students were ever given. Now, that was my only experience with Adam directly trying to teach him free fall skills, an incredibly difficult task while in free fall. 
I did not operate with him. And like I said, I haven't read the book. By all accounts, it's an amazing story. And what bothers me about that, though, is that it didn't have to be written. It didn't have to be written. It didn't have to be written. Uh, I personally feel very guilty about what happened. I feel guilty for not holding my ground more, which may not have made a difference. And by that, what I mean is I feel guilt for not holding the line and saying, no, this individual is not capable of completing the blind standard and moving forward. He was in a selection process. And in my opinion, selection needs to equal selection. You either meet the standard or you don't. We're not selecting for good guys. If that's your criteria, if you're looking for good guys, just go down to the local 7-Eleven. You're probably going to find some there. If you're selecting for a JSOC unit, hold this standard. Here's the fact. Adam had severely limited vision. If you pair that with night vision goggles, which even for somebody with 20-20 vision, that drastically inhibits their field of view. You have a much more narrow field of view. And if you watch somebody or have ever been around somebody who's on nods, you'll notice that their head is currently moving left and right and up and down. That's because you're looking through soda straws and you're trying to bring in as much information as possible by moving your head around. I don't know the exact numbers on the field of view, but it's, it's not huge. It's definitely not the near 180 degree field of view that your normal eyes have. So pair looking through soda straws with an individual who has severely limited, if not no vision in his right eye. Now, his vision may have had zero impact on his operational ability. Like I said, I did not work with the guy afterwards. It's not for me to say, that's for those who served with him to say. But I suspect it had a large impact. The bottom line is, the book could have been avoided, regardless of how amazing that book was. How? If he was still alive. How does that happen? If the standard was held, and he did not successfully screen for the command, he'd still be alive today. It's a hypothesis, but it's very likely. And I'd rather fail him for his limitations than bury him. It it bothers me to this day. Maybe the two aren't related. Maybe they are. It doesn't change his story. All it does is it would add chapters to his life. He would still be an amazing human being. He could still write that book. He would just have more to write about. And I wish I had held the line harder. Moving on, let's keep talking about standards because it ties into the next question. What are my thoughts on women serving in combat roles in the military? Have you ever witnessed people in the units you served with or elsewhere behaving unprofessionally or bad towards women in uniform. Let's start at the top. Women in uniform uh, serving in combat roles. I have zero issue with it as long as we can agree on two things. The first thing that we have to agree upon is that the job itself determines the standard, not the gender, or a desire for inclusion or striving for equality. We have to agree that the standard will be blind based off the requirements of the occupation. And if it's passed, it's passed. I would have had no issue serving shoulder to shoulder with anybody, man or woman, who met the same standards as I had to. I really, I get asked this question all the time. What do you think about women making it through buds? If a woman makes it through the same training program, that I made it through and holds the same standards that everybody in the exact same class is held to, and they are not deviated from, they are truly blind. What argument can you have against that? I'd say, bring it more power to you. So that's the first part. The second part we have to agree on is that when you combine men and women, men and women, things are going to happen. If you want an example of, um, some environments that used to be exclusively male only, and then they were integrated for men and women, go onto Google and do some research onto what happened when they integrated women onto submarines. Just take a look at the outcome. Uh, And while you're on Google, take a look at the prostitution rings that have been uncovered on Navy ships. I wish I could say it. I'm joking, but it's a real thing. Let's not pretend that it doesn't happen. That's my biggest thing. So, The job can meet, you know, the standards are set, and then let's just accept the fact 
that these things are probably going to happen and don't pretend that they're not going to. If you're not going to want to deal with them, if you don't want to deal with those consequences, then you should probably look at potentially not doing it. I'm not saying it's a reason for you not to do it. I'm just saying let's look at it objectively and realistically. All right. Some men like women, some women like guys. You put them in an environment, some stuff might end up happening. Now, on to the second part of this. Have I ever witnessed people in the units you serve with or elsewhere behaving unprofessional or bad towards women in uniform? Yes, I have. Because the uniform that you're wearing does not determine whether or not you're a good person. It doesn't hide the person that you are underneath. Um, Yeah, I've seen sexual harassment. Um, I've seen marriages implode and explode. It's not because they were in uniform. It's because of the person that they were underneath their uniform. And yeah, it happens. I've seen it. It's not a utopia of perfection. I wish I could say it was, but it's not. Next question. Things movies get right or wrong. (laughs) Let's start with what they get right. I have found that in most movies, they are correct in that when the sun is up, there is light. And when the sun is down, it is dark. And that's it. As far as what they get wrong, I would say just about everything else. And like I mentioned previously, it's a constant balance between entertainment and reality. Even a long movie, two and a half, three hours, it's just not enough. It's it's not the right medium to unpack something that requires much more time. Uh, So what happens is a lot of things are left out, a lot of things are condensed, and most of the time, much of the stuff is made up. And that doesn't mean the movies are bad. Uh, I don't look don't look at movies as a perspective of right or wrong. I would say look at them as entertainment. So go to the movies, be entertained, not for a documentary or a history lesson, and then you won't be let down. Next question: Can I elaborate on my issues with Brandon Webb? Also about why you split from CrossFit. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that I said in all the social media posts that I was dedicating this entire episode to military stuff. And I love how many archery questions I got and things like this CrossFit. Uh, I'll answer it, but God damn it. People read. All right. My issues with Brandon Webb. I'll do this as politely and professionally as possible. My personal issues with him or my personal issue with him is his loose relationship with the truth. That's the most polite way that I can say it. It's a loose relationship at best. The reality is, is he is persona non grata in the SEAL teams. And when asked about this, he blames it on the teams. He will blame the SEAL teams for his relationship with them, not his individual actions, either in the past or currently. He claims to have addressed it. And everything that I can find where he has claimed to address it, he's addressing it with somebody who doesn't know the details, that doesn't know the community. And when you address those issues with somebody who's not nuanced in them, you can get away with murder. Uh, He relies on the general public's lack of basic knowledge about the community. And I would love to uh, sit down and actually openly discuss this with him. And I reached out to him. Uh, when his company posted the video of the four soldiers getting murdered in Niger and he was not receptive to it. He wanted to, he wanted to control it. He wanted to talk about many other things. And I specifically said that I wanted to hold the master file and that I would provide him an absolutely complete and unedited version of that, but I wanted to control it. And that's where the communication ended. The invitation is always open. He has my phone number. If he wants to talk, he can absolutely do that, but he never will because you're only going to get away with murder when you're talking with somebody that doesn't know essentially what it is that you're talking about. Now, as far as CrossFit, why I split from CrossFit, uh, nothing dramatic, really. Uh, Nothing spectacular. The reality was I was kind of topped out as far as where I could go inside of the organization the fully staffed above me. And I think it was just a time in my life where I was ready to move on and do something else. Uh, The decision to leave was a very difficult one for me. From a financial perspective, it was certainly challenging. But if I look back, it was probably one of the best decisions that I ever made. But I think the organization and myself would agree 
that it was just time for me to move on and do something else. So I took the opportunity to do so, and here we are. I definitely wouldn't have a podcast today if I was still working for CrossFit, uh, for CrossFit I think. I suspect I wouldn't at the very least. Was the work atmosphere at DevGroom, which stands for Development Group, noticeably different than a normal SEAL team? I would say yes. Uh, it was because it was more focused. And the reason I think we were allowed to be more focused is that the ratio between support personnel to operators was and is uh, drastically higher than it you're going to find at a conventional SEAL team. The mission set and the job requirements there allow you to focus more on fewer things. It's less of a jack of all trades and more of a master of a few things. At a conventional team, you are, I mean, the job requirements are so vast and broad. You're constantly training and flirting with your currency. You're still expected to be able to do those things while you're out on the uh, the East Coast, but the reality of what your job is likely going to look like and what you're going to be tasked with doing, it's just different than at a conventional team. So you focus on those things and in addition to being able to focus on those things, your budget is through the roof. It's multiples of a conventional team. So you rarely get told no, if ever, on training and gear. And if you're allowed to train more specifically on certain skill sets, uh, you should probably expect an enhanced capability in those skill sets. And that really was the biggest thing. I mean, it's it wasn't crazy. Uh, it was nice. It was nice to have that ability to focus and to not be told no and to be able to get everything that you possibly wanted. Uh, I would actually describe it as an amazing environment, uh, but it, it certainly is different. What are the pros and cons of joining the military later near the maximum age as allowed by each branch? Let's talk about the cons. I would say one of the cons would be the physical nature of the job. So your recovery time and the issues you might have with your body. Now, having said that, there was a 38-year-old man in my buds class. And looking back, I didn't understand why he was eating Motrin like Skittles for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now that I'm 40, I absolutely understand why he was doing that. And I am completely baffled and amazed that he was able to make it through that training process. At the age of 18, it kicked me in the balls. I don't know if I could do it today at 40. I can tell you right now, I don't want to do it. So it was, I mean, that was amazing. It's possible is the point of saying that, but you're going to have some issues when it comes to your body. Uh, another con that you might experience, if you go in near the maximum age, uh, the military is likely going to annoy the hell out of you if you go in later in life for two reasons. One, you're going to be surrounded by people that on average are much younger than you, and there are some issues with that. And with that, uh, the people that you work for, your boss and your chain of command, is probably going to be younger than you as well, which can be very challenging. You can deal with it, but just be aware that it's it's more of a young person's game. Now, the pros. The pros of joining the military later, near the maximum age allowed, I would say is you get to bring with you your life experience, your perspective, and your maturity. All of those things come with you and to any role that you may fill, and you have a great opportunity to mentor and to shape and to mold all those younger people that you are going to be around. I, you know, it's interesting. I hear people talking about uh, when it comes to gun legislation, you know, they're talking about the difference in age between 18 or 21. And an argument is, or that I hear is, you know, if, if raising the purchasing age of a firearm to 21 is, well, why do I have to be 21 when I can join the military at 18 and give my life for my country? Maybe we should change the military age to 21 as well. I, I don't know if that's the right answer or the wrong answer, but if you think it's not uh, an age where you should be handling firearms, Maybe it's not an age where you should be able to make a decision to join the military either. I don't know if there's right or wrong there, but I think it's an interesting point because as you age in life, you do have more experience and perspective and maturity. Maybe that would be better. I don't know, but I think it's worth discussing at the very least. Last question. What's the difference between DevGrew and other SEAL teams? What's the difference between the guys? I alluded to this a little bit in the previous answer about the working environment. We'll go with between dev group and the SEAL teams first. 
The conventional teams, like I said, it's kind of a jack of all trades. Dev group, I would describe them as being more of a specialist. They have a different budget, they have different training, and they have different gear and equipment. That's the difference from a, a command perspective. Now, between the guys, I would say absolutely nothing. The Some people decide to apply for the selection process. Other people do not. And it's not a measure of the success of your career as to whether or not you go there or you want to go there. And the selection process is the opposite of BUDS. It's not designed to make you quit. It's designed to test your technical and tactical ability as a SEAL. And sometimes it takes people two or three tries, just like going through BUDS. Sometimes takes people two or three tries. It's getting through it that is important, not how many times it takes you to get through it. What I'll say about development group and the guys there, it's it's the same guys that populate the conventional teams. There's a top 10% and there's a bottom 10%. You get more training in certain areas, so you should expect an enhanced capability in those areas. That's really the only difference. You're taking the same people and allowing them to focus and train more. And because of that, they have more capability in certain levels, but there really isn't a difference between the guys other than they're going to have some more shiny objects and some more sexy gear. That's really it. That's it for this week. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. I tried to get through as many questions as possible. If you submitted a question and I wasn't able to answer it, I apologize. I got through as many as I could. I probably could have talked for six hours on all the questions that I got, but that is just too long of a podcast. So thank you for all the support. Same thing as always. I, It's awesome to see people reaching out. It's awesome to see people posting to social media with the podcast gear, seeing pictures of the hats and the stickers on vehicles or the stickers on uh, luggage, T-shirts everywhere. Uh, I can't thank everybody enough for the support. It definitely drives me to keep putting these things together, even on the days where I don't necessarily feel like I want to. Uh, yeah, it's your, it's your support, the guys and gals out there who are listening to this that make it all possible. So that's it. Uh, do me a favor, tell somebody about the podcast. If you like it, if you don't like the podcast, don't tell anybody about it. That's all I can ask. And the last thing to think of is the first thing I open the podcast with. If you're having some issues, right? This episode is brought to you by bluechew.com. It's easy. It's simple. It's the first chewable with the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. Get your first shipment free when you use the promo code HOT. doesn't have to be uppercase or lowercase, just HOT. Pay 5 bucks for shipping. On average, like I said, mine was like $6 probably because of where we live. BlueChew.com, promo code HOT if you're having any issues with the flag at half staff. And if you're not, cool. Lucky you. See you guys next week.